Welcome, everyone, and welcome Facebook Live. My name is Lenora Billings Harris. I suspect you probably already know that because you registered for this uh, Zoom. This is a Zoom forum on race, more than just talk. So many of you attended the first session, which was in June, and it was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. And uh, many of you said, please, let's let's do more. So those of you who attended that first one, thank you so much for returning and welcome to all of you who are here for the first time. If you did register through uh, Zoom, then you will get a copy of, of the uh, video just in case you aren't able to stay with us for the, the full time. So after completing the, the conversation last time, and looking at your comments and the questions you were asking, it occurred to me that there's a word that I frequently hear from my clients. They're always saying, we want our team members, we want our employees to show up and just be authentically who they are. Well, I know from a DNI perspective and certainly from a bias perspective that so often the workplace is not the kind of culture where everybody truly can show up and be authentically who they are. So this background that I have, uh, this brick wall, uh, I chose because we're really about tearing down the barriers mm. so that we can build bridges in order that more people can be fully authentic and be able to focus on the work to be done instead of pretending they are one thing when they're not. So in order to have that kind of conversation, I thought, well, we really need an expert on authenticity. And my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Jim Smith Jr. is an expert on authenticity. So I was thrilled when he said he would join us. So I'm going to introduce him in just a moment but before I do that, I want to cover a few logistics. If you're on Facebook Live and you have questions, go ahead and put them in the feed because I will have, um, have um, Jen and Patrice looking at questions so, they, so Jen can feed the questions to us. If you're on Zoom, then go ahead and write your question in the chat box. I also encourage you to share any resources that you might know of, any books that you think are terrific, to put all of those things in the chat because this session is really about sharing and it is a forum. It's not just gonna be me interviewing Jim or us talking back and forth. We do really want to get questions from you so that we can um, really make this your session as well. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Jim Smith Jr. He's the president and CEO of Jim Smith Jr. International. He's an author, a speaker, an educator, and a coach who has taken his magic to 30 plus countries and 45 states. His areas of expertise include authenticity, diversity, and inclusion, presentation skills, and leadership. When not gym packing, he spends his time working with organizations and individuals whose purpose is helping those on the autistic spectrum. Please help me welcome those of you on Zoom because you're still in gallery. Help me welcome Jim. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank so, you. So, Jim, my first question to you is, mm -hmm. so what motivated you to um, defend the proper term analogy <laughs> to defend a dissertation on authenticity. Wow. Wow. First of all, it's great to be here. Thank you, Lenore, for the opportunity. When I started uh, my doctoral work, I really didn't know for sure what I was going to study, but I wanted to make sure it had something to do with my profession, my work. So initially, I was thinking of affinity groups in the workplace or the power of affinity groups. Then I thought about fear in the workplace. Mm. Either one of them were clinging to my bones. Now I teach presentation skills and leadership and I tell those leaders, I encourage them, in order for you to be effective, 
you have to realize that it's both a skill and will endeavor and that the will must supersede the skill. Mm. And people oftentimes will say, well, Jim, you know, will, will what? I said, be courageous. Will you be vulnerable? Will you be all in? And Lenora, they would say, well, I'm, I'm one way at work and I'm one way at home. Mm-hmm. And I said, why can't you be all of you all the time? Well, some of it was fear, some of it was choice, but it started to happen in every session where people say they were two people, they were trick-or-treating every day, they wore a mask one place and a mask, mask the other place. So that's what triggered my, my yearning to study this construct called authenticity. And I am thrilled, I'm glad, God has jokes. So this <laughs> really using uh, my, my knowledge, my research, mm-hmm. and adding it to my diversity inclusion conversation. So that's why people saying I'm one way at home, or I'm one way at work, or mm-hmm. score myself maybe a five on a one to 10 spectrum at mm-hmm. home work. So I'm going to jump right in and mm-hmm. ask you, so what would authenticity look like in the workplace? What would that environment look like from your perspective? The funny thing about that, there are so many definitions of authenticity. It, it, it's very elusive. I think I mentioned to you once before, it's like picking up a bar of soap in the shower. You can't mm. pick it up. Ancient Greek philosophers would say, to thy own self be true. That was Socrates, and that was Aristotle. For me, though, and my good friend Debbie Owens just gave me this definition. We were talking recently. She said, it's honoring yourself. Mm honoring yourself and it for me it has to do with self-knowledge and self-regulation so it's honoring oneself and as i recall my 14 years in corporate a great majority of those years i wasn't honoring myself i was going along to get along i was playing it safe i was i was wanting to keep a job and having people like me Mm -hmm. put away or i kept in storage Mm -hmm. my black maleness so I was the, the worker, I was the manager, I was the leader. And with regard to race relations or how I felt about words and behaviors, kept it in. So I wasn't honoring myself. Yeah. You know, it, as a result of uh, the murder of George Floyd and all of the conversations that have been going on, one of the things I realized in my own work, and I've been in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion for over 25 years at this point, I realized although my approach is not in your face and blame and shame, um, so that, that is authentic for me, but I also started realizing how many times there were things that I really should have and could have said that I didn't for fear that I'd make people uncomfortable. Yeah. And here's the thing, people don't change <laughs> until they become uncomfortable with the status quo. And that's what we're experiencing right now. So to keep it real, I'm gonna ask you uh, to share, you have many stories, so I'm not sure which one you're gonna pick, <laughs> but give us one of the examples as a black man that you knew you were not being authentic either either when you were presenting or uh, in the workplace? Sure, sure. I remember the time where I had just finished making a presentation in front of senior leadership. And my direct boss, she was a director at the time, was there. And she asked to go back to her office to give me some feedback. I sat at the table, took my pen and paper out, ready to capture the praise and the polish. And for, let me describe her, white female, probably, I guess, in her late 40s, early 50s at the time. Her first feedback, line of feedback was, you know, Jim, when you were talking, it kind of hurt me. Okay, w- w- what do you mean by that? Not only did it hurt me, it was hurting the others in the room. Like you're listening to me, you're being very ambiguous, Matter of fact, Jim, it hurt so much that I was doing a check mark every time you did it. Do you make sense? Well, Jim, you pronounced the word A-S-K as A-X. 
but you were asking questions the entire meeting. Ask a question here, ask a question here. Are you serious? No, you pronounce ask as ax. Now, in that moment, I went red zone inside. Mm -hmm. Inside, I was thinking, well, you say use, and I never say anything. But inside, I was boiling. Now, in retrospect, what she shared was brilliant because I don't want to be a speaker asking questions, but her delivery, mm -hmm. unfathomable. It has since helped me. Every time I say ask, I'm reminded of that moment. But I did not say anything. I took it. Uh, I'll be better. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it felt like, it felt like a snowball with a rock in it. Mm -hmm. Slap. Mm -hmm. Internalized it and said, okay. All right. But I wasn't being authentic in sharing how that landed on me mm -hmm. as a Black man. So you took it in, but you didn't also share how it, how it hit you. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. One of the things that I came across, so I don't really have the, the source to tell you, unfortunately, but one of the things that I came across, because um, many Black people say X, and I got curious as to you know, kind of what's the history of the word. And what I discovered was that way back in the 1700s, to pronounce A-S-K correctly was to say ax. That's Ooh. the correct yeah. pronunciation of it. Mm -hmm. So when enslaved Africans were learning English from their masters, that was one of the words, of course, that they, because they had to ask all the time. They used it frequently, and that just stayed within our culture. Now, there may be other cultures that happen to, to say the word that way, but certainly it is very prevalent among um, African Americans. And one of the things that, that people who are different, so not necessarily specific to African Americans, um, but people who are different, want to belong just like everyone else. We all want to fit in. And so when we're at work, we're constantly covering, would be the DNI kind of word, we're constantly covering who we are because we're trying to fit in. We're trying to speak the language that you will best understand. And it's interesting to me how, how we um, go cross culture. So we know we should speak a certain way uh, at work or when we're presenting. And then when we get around people that we're most comfortable with, family members or whatever, then other language comes right in. It just, you don't even have to think about it. It comes right in because when you're around your family, that's a safe space. Now, here's the point though, is that organizations are constantly saying they want people to be authentic. So it seems to me that one of the things that we all need to learn how to do better is to give feedback in a way that's not judgmental. That, you know, that we, we hear all the time constructive feedback, <laughs> except feedback hurts regardless. Um, however, intention is not good enough. It's the impact. And that's a lot of what I'm talking about or as I'm listening to stories and then um, coaching executives is be willing to listen when you're given that feedback. And at least in your case, the feedback was, was useful for you ultimately. But I'll share um, a circumstance because I know a lot of people that are on this call right now are wanting to hear our stories so they can better understand what their workplaces are like and then what decisions they can make as executives to improve it. Sure. Um, this was several years ago. I used to work for one of the major automotive manufacturers. And um, I was the first African-American um, in this particular department. And my job was to travel all around North America. Picture this, I was in my mid twenties, travel all around North America, teaching middle aged white rich guys how to run their dealerships. And there I was, black, female and young. Now, I wasn't trying to teach them how to sell a car. 
but I was teaching the management principles, right? So at the time, I didn't realize how much of a diversity disconnect that was for a lot of people. But nevertheless, after being on, on board for about three or four months, and people used to regularly say to me, because I was the only black person in that department, oh, you know, if you do well, then you know, you'll, you'll set a good example for your people, your people. And I would swallow that. But I had a supervisor, a boss, his name was Tony, and he called me in his office one day, and uh, he said, I just want to give you some feedback on how you're doing. And I had been traveling all over, and, and way back then, they would never send a woman, let alone a black woman, out to deliver a workshop alone. So I had a partner, and of course, the partner would always be a white male. <clears throat> and so we, these week-long seminars and uh, workshops, and we'd work great together. And um, so Tony called me in and he said, you know, it's just, it's amazing. You are doing such a great job. People really enjoy you. They're learning things. He's going on and on with the praise, but uh, some, and you know, when a butt is coming and <laughs> I, I knew one was coming. Now, for those of you who know me, you know that I always have an arm full of bangle bracelets. Now I have them tied down right now so that it doesn't make the microphone crazy, but I wear bangle bracelets. And so Tony went on and on with these praises. And then he said, there's just one thing. He said, you know, I, th I think you've got potential to go someplace in this company, but there's just one thing. I'm like, well, what is that? And he said, you know, we're a pretty conservative company. Now I know as folks that don't know the automotive business would think automotive is conservative, but they really are just like any other large corporation. And he said, we're, we're pretty conservative. And, um, you know, just all of those bracelets, maybe you should just take them off and, and not wear them at work. Well, that was two mistakes. The first the one mistake was asking me to take them off, but the, the real mistake was he had never gotten to know me. Mm. He only knew me based on the work that I did. He never bothered to ask, tell me about your bracelets. Because certainly people would notice them, right? But we're so often in the workplace thinking we're not supposed to notice any difference. I had that question on a call with, a, I, was, I delivered a, a workshop last night virtually. And one of the questions that came in was, well, you know, we've been taught that we, we shouldn't notice difference. And the fact of the matter is when you don't notice difference, that causes separation, not inclusion. So anyway, he said, uh, it just, you know, leave, leave the bracelets at home. Now I wear my bracelets because my grandmother started the collection for me when I was 16 and she's no longer with me. So this is how I stay connected to her spiritually. He didn't know that. So he asked me to take those bracelets off. Now my grandmother was still alive at that time and somehow she must've been channeling me because as I started giving the answer I'm about to tell you, as it was coming out of my mouth, I realized I was making a career decision. Because what I said to Tony was, because Tony said to me, you know, that, that just could get in the way of promotions and things like that. And I said to him, you know, Tony, if I don't get considered for a position because of my bracelets, maybe I'm not working in the right place. Now, as that was coming out of my mouth, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. However, that was a moment for me where consciously or unconsciously, I had to be authentic because he was in my way, in my view, attacking really who I am and, and my values. And what subsequently happened was because of course he told other people, you know, how dare she, you know, give that kind of an answer. Apparently he said things like that and it would come back to me. And so some of the other colleagues and, and managers, after a reasonable time it passed and they gotten to know me, they said, you know, you have much more respect now than you did before. You had respect before, but you really have respect now. So my point is when we allow ourselves to be authentic and real, if we're doing it in a, you know, in a respectful manner, then that enables us to do better work. Well, I'm going to stop talking or not stop talking, but at least stop. <laughs> I want to get to some questions because um, so many of you, thank you so much, did send in some questions ahead of time. So I want to tackle um, several, as many as we can, and I'm going to go to the ones that are specifically about authenticity first. So Jim, 
how can a white ally assure their peers of color that they are acting with authenticity? Now, what I don't know is if the they is the white person or the they is the people of color, but you take it however you wish. Yeah. When I did my research, initially, I went in thinking you're either authentic or inauthentic, that there was nothing in between. When I finished my research, I finished it believing that there are degrees of authenticity where it's more or less. Mm. Existentialists will tell you a person can't consistently be authentic because we're constantly evolving. Mm. Painting is authentic. A piece of jewelry is authentic. A rug is authentic. But as humans, we're constantly evolving. So that's why I believe more or less. But the answer to that question relative to how can you show it, it has to become a part of who you are. Mm -hmm. To become a part of your walk, your talk. It has to be part of how you show up, how you encourage, how you empower. It's being vulnerable, admitting when you don't know, mm. you understand. It's letting people get into your front seat of life. Because mm. to me, your front seat in your car, the front seat items are the items that mean the most to you. Your phone, your cup of water, your sunglasses, things that you want real close to you for that trip. Mm -hmm. Well, as a leader, as an individual, when I let someone in my front seat, that means I'm willing to be vulnerable. I'm willing to show them, I'm willing to be naked and say, here I am, I'm being very transparent. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, if I lead from a front seat perspective, guess what my employees are gonna do? They're gonna let me in their front seat. Mm -hmm. Now we have a front seat relationship, the proximity is a lot closer and I'll know about those bracelets. I'll know that Jim as a 23 year old English major out of college mispronouncing a word, you may want to start pronouncing it correctly. Mm -hmm. we get when we get closer, draw closer, I think then we begin to live what we give and people will begin to believe that what we're doing is not an event, it's not a moment, it's a mission. Mm -hmm. Our mission is one in the same. Mm -hmm. Well, and here, herein lies the the brick wall, so to speak, um, that barrier, because people may want to get closer, but what I'm hearing over and over and over again in my sessions with clients is that I'm, a, I'm afraid to say anything because I might say the wrong thing. Um, I'm, I'm afraid to ask the question because I might offend. And, and much of that has to do with our human need to belong. It is so strong that even though I really want to know something about you, I might not ask it because too often, we ask the question we want to know and it lands on a person that has heard this a million times. And sometimes that person might take it in stride and realize that this person just doesn't know they're, they're really genuine. Other times though, they might get uh, a bit upset about it. I, I like um, basketball. I mean, I don't know all the players necessarily, but I've always liked basketball. And so when I started learning more about unconscious bias and learning you know, so how things show up in the workplace when we think we're making friends is one of the things that a lot of people, especially in the U.S., will say to a really tall black guy. Now, they'll say it to a white guy, too, but always to a really tall black guy. And now sometimes women, you know where I'm going, Jim, is so did you play basketball? And we think we're making friends when we ask that question. Right. Mm -hmm. But if that really tall guy didn't play basketball and he says no. Sometimes people actually say out loud, really, what's wrong with you? Or how come? In other words, because he did not fit into their square peg, he gets judgment. And if you happen to be the 14th or the 15th person in a day who asked that question, then he might say no. So the point is, yes, you wanna get in that front seat. I love that analogy. You wanna get in that front seat. And the person who is wanting to get in that front seat of your car, Often, oftentimes the intentions are good. And what I recommend though is take a breath before you ask some of the questions that are on your mind. First of all, don't do 50 questions, but take a breath and say to yourself now, hmm, if I was in that person's shoes, would I want that question? Because here's what I have learned over time. For those things that are important 
to the individual, they're going to tell you anyway. So we don't need to ask, do you have kids? Um, what part, what neighborhood do you live in? Um, what school did you go to? Uh, now, those aren't, I'm not saying never ask those questions, but my point is, as you get to know someone, if it's important to them, they're going to tell you that. Charles and I, by choice, don't have kids. And I love seeing all of my friends' um, grandkids' pictures now. I don't even have to ask. Because if you're a grandmother or a grandfather, you want people to know that you have grandkids, right? That's my point, is that you need to be willing, you need to be willing to share. And also understand that not everybody is going to want to share. And right now, what what um, people, black people are experiencing in particular is white folks who, because this is about race, so I'm bringing it back to that, is white folks who have great intention, who want to be allies, who want to be advocates, are going to their black friends and saying, help me understand, tell me your story. What you need to understand is some folks don't want to share. How, the analogy that I that comes up to in my mind is for people who have been in wars. So you know, our, our soldiers who've been in wars. Very often, when they come back, they don't talk about their experience because it's too painful. Yeah. And so, for many of us who have had um, circumstances that are we really just didn't ever want them to happen, we have to pull up a lot to be willing to share. So just be understanding if folks don't necessarily want to share. And on the other side, uh, there are those of us who know that it will help all of our learning, all of our ability to be more authentic if we are, uh, are willing um, to share. The other thing that, that tends to happen now is you go to the black person or to the gay person or to the one woman and think they're going to speak for their whole right cultural group, whatever it is. So we want to be careful about that. Lenore, two quick things relative to what you said. Number one, getting in front seat means you sharing what's in yours first. Mm. You can't withdraw unless you've made deposits. Mm. Or deposits you've made in that relationship, then you can do some withdrawing. So if we have no relationship and all of a sudden you want some front seat information, the doors are locked. Yeah, yeah. It's you, it's you admitting, I, you know, I don't know, and I've been doing some research, and I'm really talking about this race thing. Again, now you're acknowledging that this is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Now can you help me understand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how you show up for the difficult conversation? Well, and another thing that comes to my mind relative to the front seat of the car, how I like that analogy, is I've been fortunate to go to South Africa many times to do work. And um, the last time I was there, Uber was alive and well. And so my Uber driver that was going to take me to the airport, um, it, the planes leaving, coming back to the US leave like at two o'clock in the morning. So it was you know, very late at night and you're getting in the Uber and I started to do exactly what I always do, which was get in the back seat. And he said, no, 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 ma'am, please sit in the front seat because the front seat was safer. Mm. Because in South Africa, if you're sitting in the back seat, then bad people assume that's an Uber, we're gonna go rob somebody. Wow. One or the other. So the front seat is the safer seat. So if we think about that from a, from a work perspective, is your front seat safe? Ooh. Is I, your front seat safe? Hashtag stealing that. <laughs> for, that <laughs> for that person. So somebody hashtag put on Twitter already. Okay. <laughs> so let's see, what else do we have here? Um, ah. This, this is a question I get frequently, so I'll, I'll ask this of you. What's a, and Megan asked this one, thank you. Uh, what's the best way to approach having an authentic conversation with coworkers? I think you answered it a little bit already with saying, be vulnerable first, you know, share some information, but what else comes to your mind? I remember when I was beginning to do DNI work and I went to a conference for trainers but they had a track for people who wanted to do diversity and inclusion, trainers. And I went there thinking, I'm gonna to go to all the diversity and inclusion classes because right now, all I know about is being a 35 year old black man. Mm -hmm. So I remember going 
throughout the day, all the workshops, and then getting on the hotel shuttle to go back to the hotel. No one, actually, there was one person on the shuttle with me. So I walked up to her and I sat down next to her. And I said, excuse me, my name is Jim Smith. Um, my organization has just asked me to be on the diversity council and lead the diversity training initiatives. And I'm, I'm not really feeling comfortable because I don't know a lot about diversity and inclusion. And it's why I decided to sit down next to you and pose a question if that's all right. Um, you appear, again, perceptionally to be of Indian culture because you have the dot mm -hmm. there. Um, can you tell me what that means? Because that's going to strengthen mm -hmm. diversity toolkit when I get back. She started laughing. That's funny, Mr. Smith. And she introduced herself. She said, you, are, you and I are in the same boat. I'm just beginning to lead my organization's diversity and inclusion initiative. And I have a question for you. Should I call you Black or African American? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, Lenore, we stayed on that shuttle back and forth, back and forth, having that conversation that began uncomfortable and became very comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you don't approach the conversation like you are the expert. You approach it, your energy should be one of vulnerability and seeking to understand because you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. It's something like, you know, based on everything that's happening now in this world, diversity and inclusion, anti-racism, micro inequities, they're important to me now. And mm -hmm. I need to understand more about those because I don't. Would you mind sharing some thoughts if you have some relative to those? Mm -hmm just asking for permission because that person may not like Lenora said may not want to talk about it mm -hmm. may not believe that you really want to know mm -hmm. do you know because you have to now know or do you want to know because you want to know mm. and we can feel the have to know energy yeah yeah and you know what comes to my mind as you say that because another question and by the way there's some people wondering so do you say black or african american my <laughs> question by the way is yes <laughs> um, because it, de it depends. I mean, obviously, if you're talking to one person, you call them by their name. Uh, if you need to make a general statement, and I know several of you on this call are executives, and you speak to your, your staff on a regular basis, when you need to make a general statement, African American is the more formal, if you're talking to Americans, is the more formal uh, version. Um, however, if, if you're uh, global, and or you're not quite sure of the ethnicity of the people in, on your team, then black is appropriate too. But here's the reason why some folks like black, some folks prefer African-American. In most newspapers, it's starting to change a little bit, but in most newspapers, when they are referring to a black person, clearly the word black is referring to an ethnicity. The B is small case when you're referring to a black person and you say african-american you have to capitalize both a's so it's a matter of respect some people prefer african-american because it shows more respect now if you're from jamaica born in jamaica then you're not african-american you're black because you would most would prefer that you call them Jamaican to begin with. So it's, it's a rock and a hard place kind of thing, but it brings us back to be willing to be vulnerable and ask the people in your workplace what their preference is. You're going to get both. But then when you're presenting, when you're actually talking or when you're writing your speech and that kind of thing, say black sometimes, say African-American sometimes so that, that way you cover it all. When I'm um, presenting, sometimes I say white, sometimes I say Caucasian, sometimes I say European American, because outside of the US, typically they'll, and when they're referring to white people in the US, they often will say European American. So you're never gonna get it totally right, but at least be willing to have that conversation. Um, the, the other thing that I was gonna go to though, is what black, many black women experience. And believe it or not, even with me, with so little hair. I actually experienced the same thing last summer. 
what happens to many black women is who have um, dreads, dreadlocks, locks, whichever term you like to use, or braids or fancy hairstyles, is a white person, both men and women do this, by the way, is they will say, oh, your hair is so nice, can I touch it? But unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, they put their hands in the person's hair while they're asking, can they? Mm. Now, some of you, I'm sure, are saying, no, people don't do that. Trust me, every time I'm in front of a group and I start that e example, the Black women in the audience are nodding their head that it happens all the time. And here's what folks don't recognize. Number one, you're touching somebody's body. Did they give you permission to touch their body? Number two, it's not a Black person that's doing it to another Black person, usually. I mean, I'm sure it probably does happen once in a while. But for the most part, it's a white woman touching the hair of a Black woman, which then brings in the power piece. It might not have been your intention, but as a white person, you think it's okay to touch a Black person when you didn't have permission. That's how it could be interpreted. Why don't you just say, I love your hairstyle? Now, what, what is, I seem to be getting a lot of lately is men, I, just last night on, this, on the same call I referred to a moment ago, it's one of the questions that came up is that the, um, the boss said to a Black employee, so is that your hair or is it extensions? Now, what jumps into my head is, well, if you paid for it, it's still your hair. But here's the real question. Why does it matter? So slow down a moment to ask what, why does it matter? Because if you actually start thinking about it, it probably doesn't really matter, especially if her hair is pretty. I mean, you know, if you think it's pretty, then that's what you say. You don't have to ask those uh, more stereotypical questions, but it's, it's um, uncomfortable ground for all of us, not just for uh, Caucasians, European Americans, and white people who are wanting to know more of the story and, and uh, have an understanding of systematic, um, systemic racism. And that it's not just uncomfortable for them, it's uncomfortable for black folks too, to be asking, to be asked those questions um, so often. And when those microaggressions happen in the workplace, you know, if there's just one little thing then that's probably, you can get over that. But when the same thing keeps happening all the time, then it's like, um, uh, the, what I think about is when you're walking down the street and it's really, really hot and you, you accidentally walk into a sea of gnats that are flying in the other way, right? It's a lot of them, it's awful, it makes you uncomfortable. And so then when the person doesn't respond in the tone of voice that you think is appropriate and you're wondering, well, what's wrong with them? Well, reverse it. Just think about, hmm, may, is there another way I can ask that? And, you know, have some one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two conversations and ask all of the quote-unquote dumb questions because they're really not dumb unless you don't ask them. But, but talk to people that you trust already, who you're already in their front seat and say, okay, you know, I've got some questions. I know they're going to be dumb or you might think they're dumb, but I really don't know. And then be willing to listen to the answers. And here's the other piece, is listen to their answers with intention of being influenced. Not listening for them to share, and then they put a period at the end of it, and then you share what you think is a similar experience. This is not the right time to do that. Because if they were willing to be vulnerable enough to tell you a heart-wrenching story, most likely you don't understand. You're attempting to, but when you say, oh, well, something similar happened to me, unless you're another black person, not likely. So separate those two conversations. Share, but share that piece at another time. So Look, before I go to some more questions, yes, Jim, go ahead. Based on what has happened this year, what I encourage leaders to do is develop or determine at least three areas that mean three values that are very, very important to you. Say, for exa example, safety, distance, and diversity inclusion. Those three, based on corona, based on social distancing, based on people working from home, and then diversity inclusion. And I would tell my team that those three areas mean a lot to me. So throughout the rest of 
this year, I'm going to be asking for feedback in how I'm doing in those areas. Mm -hmm. I want you to assess how I'm showing up relative to my three important values. Mm -hmm. That will be a segue or key to have that diversity and inclusion conversation. You bet. And here's, here's what I would suggest. And, and uh, I, I've had an accountability partner and she's on the call right now, Chris, um, for nine years, I think. It started out to be something that was going to be three months. And we are still accountability partners. I like to call it success partners at this point. Mm. But what I, what I encourage people to do, and I'm always encouraging my, my uh, client audiences to do this, is to find someone you trust, not your partner, spouse, not that kind of trust because it's filled with emotion, um, but find a good friend, somebody, you, maybe somebody you work with that knows you well and partner with them and do exactly what you just said. Is I'm on this journey, a, an attempt to un, uh, disrupt my biases, to uncover them and disrupt my biases and to learn more about people different than me. And what I need from you, Jim, if you're my partner, is as you see me just generally interacting, don't throw me under the bus, but when it's appropriate, give me feedback. That's good. And when I get that feedback, I need to listen with intention of being influenced rather than being defensive. It is so powerful to do that. And what you'll find, and the, the partner is your partner, it's not their job to make you feel bad when you've not achieved whatever the goal is. Uh, and what you do is you, you know, meet every 10 days or so, however it is you want to meet. You set a goal of what you're going to do. And it may be it's going to be you're going to take that first step and develop more knowledge. So you're going to read one of the myriad of books that are out there now around racism. And so you say, well, when we get together in 10 days, I, I will have read whichever book it is. And if you get together at that 10th day and you didn't read the book, your partner's job is not to make you feel bad. Your partner's job is to help you break down that goal into something that is doable. So maybe the next time it's, okay, I'm going to read three chapters or I'm going to listen to the audio book. But you hold each other accountable because when we verbalize what we want to do and we share it with the partner and we're doing it back and forth, then we're more likely to achieve those goals. Well, there's some questions that are a little tougher now that, I'm, that we're going to come up with. And I do encourage you, by the way, those of you um, who have been listening and watching to please write in the chat or on Facebook Live uh, your questions as well, because I'll be going to Jen in a moment and asking her what questions she has. So what, is, what are the best starting points? Well, and, and several of the questions have the best, and frankly, there is no the best. There's many different ways to do this. But what are, what is the best, what are the best starting points to move my very white staff forward? I've got some thoughts. What are yours? Yeah, I do. I, I do too. Um, understanding first why you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Why will be your driver throughout if you face resistance. Like going to the doctor before he or she gives you the medicine or the panacea or what you need, they assess, they ask, they want to find out where it hurts. They want to find out how long it's been hurting, what time of day it hurts. Mm -hmm. They uncover, they go to uncover. So one of the things I would suggest is uncover the fear, uncover where it's coming from, uncover why it's there. Mm -hmm. creating it, what's triggering it. But once you uncover, then you can push in to discover even more. Mm -hmm. They are working in a system right now that's working for them. Why change it? Mm -hmm. And if we change it, then I'm going to lose something is the mindset. What's in it for me to move? Yeah. So that leader has prepared to discuss that. That leader has to be prepared to be vulnerable and push that. And then have the mindset, listen, you have people who are willing to risk their life right now by converging together, by going out without math. They're willing to risk their life because that's what they want, that thing, the, the party, the, the being with the friends, they want it that bad. Mm -hmm. But when people want something that bad, then they're willing to move. But why aren't we willing to move now? 
Mm -hmm. And for many people, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt bad enough. Yeah. And, and there is that, that, um, that scarcity thinking that if I do this, then I'm giving up some of my power rather than thinking what my diversity of thought makes the pie bigger for all of us. Um, what I'm experiencing uh, on the, on the um, listening sessions, in fact, one of the things that, that I share with the executives before we even launch the session, usually I facilitate it, but the executives are on it. Um, I'm going to ask them to kick it off. And what I share with them is please, please don't start off with the reason we want to do this or know this and then go into numbers because that's like EEOC kind of stuff. That's staying in your head. Your folks do not want to hear the numbers right now, even though there is all kinds of research that absolutely proves that diverse, when you're diverse and inclusive, you do better than your competition in every measurable uh, way. But in this time where things are so sensitive, what you want to do is to share with your staff why you, why you personally think this is important right now. It may be the right thing to do. That might be what it is. But your employees will feel safer sharing their stories if you share your story first. And my experience is that every time I talk privately with an executive who brings me in that wants me to do uh, D&I work, I will talk with them privately and behind closed doors. And I don't, you know, it's not going to not going to tell anybody, their employees or anyone, what they tell me. I said, what's your real reason for doing this? Mm. And sometimes I have to ask it several different ways and it might take 20 minutes to get to the answer because executives are used to telling you the, you know, kind of the stockholders answer. Mm. And I said, no, no, but, but really, what, what happened that caused you to now see this as something you need to do? And for many of them right now, it's because they were totally oblivious uh, no fault of their own. They just, they were totally oblivious to some of the things that are happening in their workplace. I had one employee share with the CEO that um, when he, I want to be careful that you can't even guess at who it is. Um, this this uh, black male engineer said, part of my job requires me to go to a certain place, to a certain part of the organization, which is not in headquarters. And he said, what I have learned to do is to go in and I have to stay in that area overnight, usually a couple of nights. But I've learned that I go, I do my work, I leave immediately, you know, have lunch, leave right after and go to my hotel and that's it. And the question of course is why? He said, because for that particular environment, I'm the only black man, the only black person there. And the other folks are very comfortable sitting at tables close enough at lunch for me to overhear their conversation and they talk about things that make me fear for my life. I don't know if they would ever make it real, but I don't want to give them that chance. Uh The CEO was speechless because people have not felt safe enough to share those kind of stories. Now, why would it be important? Because that employee can't give 100% if he's busy worrying about his life. So if we're wanting our employees to show up and give 100, 110% or whatever, then we obviously need to do something in the environment. And to your point of asking why or getting clear in your mind why it is so critical. Why do you really want to do this? And I'm encouraged that there are so many people who just didn't know the history you know, there's, there's a reason why you learned about some people, but you, you never heard of E.B. Du Bois. I remember, it was really only about 15 years ago, I read a book about Thurgood Marshall. Now, I knew who he was, you know, because I was alive while he was alive. But I didn't know the deep history. I, didn't, I knew Brown versus Board of Education. That was about it. I read that book. I was proud and angry at the same time because it wasn't taught in school. So there are things that none of us know, but that doesn't mean we have to stay in that space of ignorance. We can uh, do some things about it. So Jen, any questions out there? I still have several more here, but any questions that come in? 
<laughs> Actually, we don't have a lot of questions. We do have one, but we have a lot of comments and a lot of reaction agreeing with you on the hair. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> One question for Jim regarding the story that you told back at the very beginning um, when you were approached about pronouncing ask. Ask. And yeah. a, yes, exactly. So at that time, you said that you kind of kept that in. And what would you, how have you, would you have reacted to that now? Yeah, absolutely. I, I've since learned 30 years later that silence is violence. I am dying inside and the organization is dying because they're not getting the best of me. I would have used an approach where I would have said, you, what you, what you just said to me, it hurts. Here's why it hurts. Then I would ask them, did they intend for it to hurt or why didn't they frame it a different way? So I want to start with the facts give my opinion of what happened and then ask for the other person's opinion and let's see what we're going to do going forward so that this doesn't happen again mm -hmm. rather than sitting on my stuff because when you sit on your stuff you go home exhausted not from the work you did that day but from the covering i call it working overtime you think about what you're going to say before you get to work and then you think about it throughout the course of the day. And then you think about what you didn't say going home. <laughs> I think about work. You're mm -hmm. exhausted about how do I, how do I stay true? And then we move into forecasting failure because if I say that this is what's going to happen to me. So now there's a lack of accountability on my part. So both of us are dying, the organization and the individual. So yes, I would speak up now and I do. <laughs> And I do it in a way to bridge a gap, not to get defensive. Mm -hmm. I want us both to learn from that. Yeah. And the, the, one of the things that, that we need to keep in mind is for Black folks and Black men in particular, because we're seeing so much of what uh, is, is happening to them uh, via police and, you know, just all kinds of ways, is there are so many reasons not to speak up because it just might not be safe enough. But to your point, you, the other person and the organization loses when you carry that home. Now, you might have figured out by now, I didn't happen to mention it in the introduction, but those of you viewing this might have figured out by now that uh, Jim's background is Philadelphia. And I used to live in Philadelphia too. And in fact, my, my last corporate position was one in Philadelphia. I worked right downtown Philly. And it was in the beginning of companies starting to pay attention to professional women. And there was this book called How to Dress for Success by John Malloy, a book about how to dress for success for women written by a man, by the way. But there were so few women at the top of the organization that he wrote this book. And I read it because I wanted to be seen as professional. And what he essentially said is you must wear a suit that is a jacket and a skirt, do not wear pants. Now this was way back in the late 70s, early 80s. And you wore a little boat, you wore white blouse, a little bow tie, and um, your hair should not touch your shoulders. And at that time I had longer, much longer hair, but I'd wear it back in a bun or do something so it didn't touch your shoulders. You shouldn't wear jewelry that made noise. I did not take off my bracelets. That was, that was pushing too far for me. And, um, and so there were all these things that you had to do. Well, I dressed that way. I remember having to think about what do I wear today, I, even down to which briefcase I carried based on who I was going to meet with that day. Now, here's the point. For women at that time and, and people who are different in any way, spending all that time being that concerned about will they show up in a way where they can fit in, they're not spending that time trying to solve whatever the problem is of the day. So when my husband Charles and I moved to, to Phoenix, where often I will give, you know, give clothes away to, to Goodwill or whatever, those little ties, I burned them. I did not want another woman feeling like she had to wear them. It, <laughs> that, it was filled, for me, it just had so much energy and it had so much negativity in it because that was just not who I was. 
Okay, I think we've got time for mm, maybe one more question. Um, so we're going to go with, this is a tough one here. Um, so the, I'm going to ask this one. Uh, what guidance would you offer to address the lack of inclusion in the workplace? I'm going to jump in first and let you take, let you take a breath while you think about it. Um, so one of the things you could do is what Jim was suggesting earlier, and, and uh, I was too in various ways, is to think about who it is you want to go to and go equipped with reasons that this would be important for the organization. Because again, people don't change unless they get uncomfortable with the status quo. So from my perspective, if the organization wants to attract and retain the best talent, the best talent comes in all kinds of packages. And so you may need to do a bit of research and find out what the organization's current practices are and then find a champion find someone who you think would actually listen to your perspective. And then you might start small, but then go bigger. Now, obviously change happens faster if it starts at the top, uh, but it doesn't have to start at the top. And certainly with all of the protests and everything going on right now, it didn't start at the top. It really started with a lot of people focused in the same direction, keeping their eye on the, on the prize and keeping it alive, constantly talking about it. So find some champions because the fact of the matter is, even if you think there might not be any, there probably are some, but do a little bit of research first and then talk to that person. And then the two of you can be allies together. And um, what I'm going to do with the other questions that we have, I'm gonna give Jim a chance to answer this and to make some closing comments, um, is that I will answer them. I'll answer them, or we will answer them via video and then we'll post the video so that you can see the answer because these are great questions, some of which it would take the whole hour just to answer the, the one question. So Jim, anything to add to that question? Sure, and since time is getting away, I'll be brief. Uh, several things. Diversify the look of your leadership team and know that just because you're diversifying the look, if the roots of the corporation of micro inequities are still in place, just because you have it, it's not going to work. It's comparable to, I like to say, what's in the window is not what's in the store. Mm. If I have the diversity in the window, you may have a very diverse group of people but it's the system empowering that diversity to help the organization exceed its goals. Number two, contribute to research on and contribute to research on anti-racism. Because mm -hmm. if I'm contributing to the research, it's going to come back and help me be smarter. Number three, I would definitely recruit from diverse universities from black universities, historically black colleges. If I want to diversify my team or have more black leaders on my team, I have to know where to go. Mm -hmm. And when I worked in corporate, oftentimes the organization I worked for would do that, but they would send all white recruiters. Mm -hmm. And the students would laugh and saying, I want to see someone who looks like me to determine if it's safe there and you're not doing that. So they would, they would, they wouldn't take them seriously. So it's putting your money there. And last one also would be from a performance management standpoint, I would put managing diversity and inclusion into performance appraisals Absolutely. to determine, let's see how you do it each and every day for that year. And you get assessed on it. The, the, the CEO of Microsoft was being interviewed. I don't remember if it was CNN, MSNBC, Fox, one of those. And the question was asked, are leaders held accountable for diversity and inclusion? And he said, yes. And they've been doing that for years. But that's the one thing that most organizations won't do. So that's, that's um, pretty key. So Jim, a minute for closing thoughts, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the first diversity and inclusion organizations I worked for, the CEO had this, this model, he, he called it vectors. A, vect, a vector is a force with movement in direction, either going east to west or west to east. And he likened it to, if you are running and the wind's behind you pushing you, the wind's pushing you forward, 
juxtaposed to walking into the wind. So there's either tailwinds or headwinds. What organizations could do or should do is eliminate the headwinds mm. for people of color, for black people, eliminate the headwinds. Now, you know, when there's headwind, you still reach that destination, but you get there, you're tired, you're more exhausted, you've been walking in the wind. Tailwind, you might get there faster and think, oh, I'm just better. No, you get a tailwind. <laughs> Leaders going forward, I encourage you, get, get rid of, delete those headwinds. Create more tailwinds. From California to Philly, from Philly to California, the shorter trip, west to east, yeah, on the same place. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jim. Oh my gosh, there were so many tweetable comments that you made. It's just amazing. So I want to, want to leave you with this. First of all, again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we've, we've on TV and the media and everywhere, we've been hearing a lot about what's happening to black men. And June was Pride Month. It didn't get a lot of attention because of everything else that was going on. But I wanna leave you with a statistic and then also a definition. I heard this statistic about three weeks ago and it just brought me to tears. Mm -hmm. For a black trans woman, their life expectancy is 35 years, 35 years. We have not given attention to all of the abuse and the murders, et cetera, for black women, period, and particularly black trans women. So I wanna leave you with this, and those of you who know me, I say this all the time, Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Zulu proverb, and when I learned what it meant, I realized that was the broad definition of diversity and inclusion. Ubuntu means I am because we are. We are because I am. Well, I'm motivated to do another of these. I don't know how long they're going to last, but I just keep thinking of more things that we can share and learn from each other. And I hope that you will go on this journey with me. So join us the next time. You certainly will get an email uh, or it'll be posted on social media on when the next one will be. Thank you so much. Please stay safe, stay healthy, wear a mask for you and for me. Bye now. <laughs>